going to Euroleague after a three year absence you find different competition format you find less teams more games you find double game weeks a heavier schedule overall many former NBA players how much more challenging is this competition it's a lot more talent um, teams got a lot better from I mean overall every team got better uh, a lot more players wanted to come back and play EuroLeague because of the competition um, and it's a lot uh, a lot more fun like before you could go through uh, to get to a final four and not play against certain teams now you have to play everybody you get to travel to every city so uh, I think it's a lot better than what it was you know the last time I played you signed with uh, Barcelona mm -hmm. and uh, this is the first time in your career that you are on a team that it has such an intense big time rivalry mm -hmm. with another team, Real Madrid. And it's a rivalry that uh, involves two clubs with millions and millions of fans, yep. not only Spain, mm -hmm. around the globe. How do you experience this as a player of Barcelona? Um, it's big because, you know, just that rivalry. You know, for me personally, I'm not big on rivalries. I don't, honestly, I don't care. I just try to do my job. Once you play in the rivalry, it's big. But, you know, after my career is over, like, I'm not involved in the rivalry. So um, I enjoy it. You know, the fans are passionate on both ends. Uh, you know, I love the fans in Barcelona. They've been welcoming me since I've been there. Um, just talking to them a lot on social media. Uh, they're very passionate about the rivalry. So for me, you know, I kind of try to take pride in, you know, making sure they stay happy as well as we play well because it goes hand in hand. We need the fans to win big games and, you know, the fans look forward to us, you know, whether it's making their day better or for the season, you know, trying to get a trophy for them. It's something that lasts a lifetime for them. So it's fun and um, just experiencing it a couple times we've played this season. Uh, like I said, the game is, is a lot uh, funner. You talked about trophies, mm -hmm. and that's the main goal of Barcelona. When you made it to the Final Four in 2016 with Lokomotiv Kuban, it was an overachieving accomplishment. No one saw you coming. You were the underdogs, for example, the playoffs against Barcelona. But Barcelona begins every season with the goal of making the Final Four, and they haven't been in the Final Four since 2014. They haven't won the championship in Spain since 2014. Do you feel any amount of pressure that you perhaps haven't felt in your career so far? Uh, not really. Of course, we all know the big goal, but it's not like the club is in the locker room every day saying, okay, we need to win the championship. We need, like, we don't get reminded by this. Uh, we're just trying to be better. We know we have the, the team that's capable of doing it. Um, and it's really up to us. You know, it really doesn't depend on anybody else. We feel as though if we play the right way and we're playing well at the right moment that you know, we could for sure take home the trophies, but also if we don't, we, we could lose. And in Loco, I think if you go back and look at the players we had on that team, when coach came and took the job, he built the team like expecting the championship. Nobody really respected us, but if you look at the players on the team, it was one of the best rosters, you know, in the last couple of years in EuroLeague and the style of play we had played a major uh, factor in it. So. Um, we, we strived and uh, we thrived off of uh, being underdogs because we knew most of the times we were better than a lot of the teams, but we had no pressure. And like you said here, we have a lot of pressure. We have a target. Everybody plays their best game against us in ACB and in EuroLeague. So, you know, we have to come to play every night. And that's the biggest difference. Like the Barcelona stamp, everybody wants to beat us. Everybody wants to try to get to play on a Real Madrid or Barcelona. So everybody wants to prove a point. And that's the only difference I really see. Um, we get everybody's best shot. You generally are perhaps the most active player uh, on Twitter. What's the nastiest thing that you ever saw on Twitter um, written about you? Ever? Perhaps directed of you. <laughs> ever? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's been like racist comments and stuff like that. Uh, but to be honest, I really don't care. Like, I know how fans are. Like, and for me, I don't take Twitter personal. Like, it's a lot of people who never get a chance to talk to athletes. They can say whatever they want. Like, they know they wouldn't say it to my face. So, like, for me, most of the times it's funny. Like, but when people send death threats or something like that, even though maybe for them it's a joke, like, you know, I don't, I'll just block them. Like, you know, I don't, I don't really care for stuff like that, but I don't take it serious. Social media is, you know, like I said, I use it to interact with the fans. Um, to keep people updated in the states or wherever my fans are uh, with what I'm doing, and that's it. Like I don't leave Twitter and then go home and cry because somebody 
you know, sent a death threat or made something personal. Um, for me, it, it's not that big. It's I use it for what it is, and that's it. You said in an interview that you hated basketball during your second season with Atlanta Hawks. The NBA remained mm. a, a priority even after this not so pleasant experience. Your stint with Barcelona has been brief so far. Is it enough to make you change your priorities and perhaps put EuroLeague, even Barcelona, a little ahead of an NBA return? I, I don't really mark anything ahead. The NBA is the best league in the world. Like my comments about my personal experience wasn't about the NBA. I didn't hate yeah. the NBA. I hated my situation my second year because the first year I thought I played okay. Um, and then going into the second year, I was given certain instructions about, you know, what was expected of me. I worked my hardest, I was in my best shape. And my second year, you know, I didn't really get the opportunity that I thought I would get. Uh, we were pretty much tanking. They wanted to play young players, so for me, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't my thing. I started playing well, had an ankle injury. I actually wanted to get traded, um, but I didn't get traded. So my second year was kind of rough, mainly because we didn't win. And my first year, we had a good team. My second year, we just, we lost a lot. And for me, coming from Europe or wherever I've been, I've always cared about winning. And in Europe, and you I won, won many things, you yeah, won many times. Everywhere, everywhere went. I went, I won. And we made the playoffs my first year in Atlanta. My second year, we weren't close. We weren't even really competing. So that was the biggest thing. I think some people, when I first did it, some people called me, it was like, you don't need to talk about certain things at the NBA. I'm like, I talk about my personal experience. I always say the NBA is the best league in the world. The the life in the NBA can't compare anywhere. I don't I don't care what team it is uh, overseas. You can't compare it to the NBA. So uh, going back to your question, I don't know what will happen in the future. But you know, for me, if I do stay in Europe, um, I want somewhere to be my home. I have I think if I do play in Europe, it'll be three more years. It's my goal. Um, and wherever I do play, I want to play for the next three years. So, you know, whether it's here, wherever, um, everything doesn't depend on me. And I just play basketball. I don't really think about that stuff. Uh, I just focus on what I need to focus on. Uh, you know, my family is my main priority. And, you know, when any decision comes about, my family will be first. So, you know, I got to think about a lot of things before the future. In general, uh, we see American players that, uh, for one reason or another, don't find a place in the NBA. They accomplish many things in Europe. Kyle Hines, for example, has become a legend mm -hmm. in uh, European basketball by the things he has done. Do you think that it's a bit unfair uh, that, for most people in the USA, mm. a player's legacy, an American player's mm. legacy, is measured, defined even, mm. only by what he has done in the NBA? To a certain extent, yeah. But, um, it's because the, the people in the States don't really follow European basketball. So, like, a lot of people in the States don't know who Kyle Hines is. Also hey. talking about media and fast. For example, Charles Barkley uh, was yeah, snapping yeah, no, Luka Doncic. Yeah, yeah, you saw yeah, the comments yeah, yeah. But just because he was coming from that's Europe. What I'm saying. They don't understand. They know who Kyle Hines is. But if they look up Kyle Hines from the States, he went to a small school. He wasn't a superstar player. They don't know the impact that he has on a EuroLeague team, how many championships he's won, and they don't care. And then, like you said, with Luca, like I was telling people about Luca, and was everybody was looking at me like, or tweeting me like, nah, he's not. I'm like, look, certain players who come from Europe who aren't good, they have potential, but there's some special players that come around every now and then that we know will be good in the NBA. And Luca was one of those guys that you knew instantly he would make an impact. but. As far as what people think, for me, I don't care. Like I don't, like I know what I've done in my career. I think the the top players from the states who play Euroleague don't care. I think we all share the same attitude. It's not about proving uh, people in the, the states wrong or anything. We come over here. It's players that come over here who make more money than NBA players, Definitely. who live better lifestyles, and they win. And you can't compare that to somebody who goes doesn't play in the NBA they finish their careers broke or just because they try to prove a stereotype about NBA players. So like I said, for me, I know I have friends over here who share the same mentality. I don't care. Like we know what we've done at the end of the day. Um, we're stamped in Europe. If you make it to the NBA, it's a blessing and 
like that's it for me. I, I really didn't. I never put the NBA on a, a pedestal. It was something that I always wanted to do. I got a chance to do it. Um, I love the experience, um, but you know, certain situations don't work out your way, but it's, it's not in my control. I did what I had to do, and after that, it's, it's all in other people's hands. Which player from Europe right now, if you took them right now and you drop them mm -hmm. on an NBA team, they could produce instantly? Sergio, I would say. Like, Sergio he's a player who everybody expected to go to the NBA. Um, you know, he's been one of the top names over here for a while who never played in the NBA. So you had to go to a player like that. Uh, I'm trying to think about other people. I was expecting Faku from Real Campazzo, perhaps. Yeah, but I, I would take, <laughs> for NBA, I would take you over. Yeah. I mean, Campazzo is a great player. Well, it's the popular it's choice to you. Yeah. yeah, it's a different type of game with size and spacing. Um, I think Campazzo will be a great passer. But it's kind of how uh, Sergio Rodriguez was before, and he went to the NBA. But I think with the athleticism and his size, you will be probably the ideal person. Even after the injury? Played. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just saying talent. American players, we know there are many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would name, it would be my friends though. Everybody would say I'm biased, so I won't, I won't talk about American players.